Just move, you just shove it aside. Uh, maybe a few minutes while we Is Judge Bruce Schrader. We will listen in live in Kenosha. Um, by the way. And Suzanne Spencer joining me here in studio as well as we get our look at Kyle Rittenhouse. Again, the breaking news at just past noon this morning that a verdict has been reached in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Suzanne. And as we await the judge to begin speaking here, initially we were told it would be about an hour before we learned of the specific verdict itself. Uh, it is unclear if the plan has changed, so to speak, from Judge Bruce Schrader. Again, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse is charged with uh, killing two people and injuring a third. Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, and Gage Grosskreutz have been the focus of this trial and what happened in August of 2020 in Kenosha. This was uh, in a series of protests after the shooting of Jacob Blake by Kenosha police officer Rustin Chesky. Justin Blake, uh, Jacob's uncle, has been an integral part of uh, Definitely uh, since this whole incident has happened, he's actually been outside the Kenosha County Courthouse since this has happened. Uh, but as we take a live look, certainly a lot of emotion as we await to hear the final verdict for Kyle Rittenhouse. The defense team there uh, packed with emotion. We're told that Wendy Rittenhouse sitting behind her son a few rows back, uh, certainly expressing emotion, nervous. You can imagine what's going through all of their minds at this moment, Carl.
And same with Kyle Rittenhouse. The uh, most serious of the charges he would face includes life in prison. Some of the others uh, would not be as long a time in prison. Some of the others also included lesser charges, uh, lesser considerations that the prosecution asked for before the jury went into deliberations. But the most serious charge could send Kyle Rittenhouse to prison for life if the jury finds him guilty. The argument from the defense the entire time throughout this trial has been that Kyle Rittenhouse acted in self-defense that night of August 25th, 2020. No one disputes that he did shoot three different men, killing two of them that night. The question, uh, though, was you, he uh, provoked into shooting in the, uh, and self-defense? Let's um, listen to Judge Schrader. No, it doesn't need to be. Um, there, there, there can't be any reaction at all, no matter how strongly you may feel. And it's understood that many people do have strong feelings. But uh, we can't permit any, permit any kind of a reaction to the verdict. And uh, as you can see, there is quite a bit of law enforcement here. And you will be whisked out of here if there is any. So just be aware. Go down, please. Yes. Thank you. All right, members of the jury, have you uh, elected a four-person? Would you uh, ask, uh, give your juror number, please? 54. 54. And uh, has the jury reached a verdict as to each count of the information? Yes, we have, Your Honor. Uh, one verdict and one verdict only? Yes. Would you hand all of the paperwork to the bailiff, please? This is the ones that we did in the okay. uh, Everything. Okay. Yeah, thanks. See that too, please, uh, Mrs. Oh, Chairman. Thank you. face the jury and hearken to its verdicts. David Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse. As to the first count of the information, Joseph Rosenbaum, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. 
As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Members of the jury, are these your unanimous verdicts? Is there anyone who does not agree with the verdicts as read? Would you wish the jury polled? No. Okay. Okay, folks, your job is done, and we started just about three weeks ago. And I told you it could last two weeks and two days. This is three weeks. You were a wonderful jury to work with. You were punctual. You were attentive. And the forgotten six over here who had a very difficult job of keeping from discussing the case during the time that they were sequestered as well. All of you, I couldn't have asked for a better jury to work with. And it has truly been my pleasure. I think without commenting on the verdicts themselves, just in terms of your attentiveness and the cooperation that you gave to us, justifies the confidence that the founders of our country placed in you. So I dismiss you at this time. You're never under any obligation to discuss any aspect of this case with anyone. You're welcome to do so as little or as much as you want. The media have requested, a number of media sources have requested the ability to talk to you, and they have been allowed to present presentations to you that you'll get in writing. And it's entirely up to you whether you want to contact them. They are not to contact you. If anyone does contact you and just tell them you're not interested in discussing it, if that's the case, and if anyone persists in doing so, report that to us and it will be addressed, I assure you. At the beginning of the trial, there was some concern about information and your safety. And I assure you that we will take every measure to ensure that your concerns are addressed and respected. And I'm going to talk to you for just a minute, not about anything to do with the case, but just about that sole issue. And as I say, you're welcome to discuss the case as little or as much as you want. And any questions, anybody? Thank you so much. And after four years, you're eligible for service again. It would be my pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Yeah, please. Or in the library. They can attend the library. It's not going to be more than a minute. Or maybe it will be. Yeah, take them upstairs. That's fine. That's fine. Mr. Richards? Any word from the state? The jury has trusted our community in this trial and has spoken. All right. The motion of the defendant is granted. The charges against the defendant on all counts are dismissed with prejudice. And he is released from the obligation of his bond. Anything else? No. Thank you. Good day.
And with that, a momentous day in Kenosha. Kyle Rittenhouse, a free man, found not guilty on all five charges he faced. We saw Rittenhouse immediately break down, fall down back into his chair as the last count of not guilty was read. His lawyers embracing him, telling him to breathe, as you can imagine, overcome with emotion, and then very quickly leaving the courtroom as he will be able to do as a free man. The city of Kenosha, the county of Kenosha, preparing for this moment as law enforcement stands outside the Kenosha County Courthouse. Judge Bruce Schrader calling the jury's service here a punctual, attentive after coming to a decision in this case after three and a half days of deliberations. The defense attorneys uh, there, there at the end after hearing the verdict, shaking hands. Wendy Rittenhouse uh, glancing to both of her sides to the people sitting next to her likely probably talking about how they're going to get out uh, of the courthouse after this historic moment in this case. We saw a quick flash of Aaron Mabin, who was live inside the courtroom, saying that Kyle's mother, Wendy Rittenhouse, his sister were crying as the verdict was read, as they realized that their son and brother will go free. They were heard gasping as the verdict was read, according to Aaron Mabin inside, and he could still hear uh, them overcome with emotion. But as you could see, the courtroom very quickly cleared out a long stretch, a trial that lasted almost a full three weeks, three and a half days of jury deliberations after the case went to the jury on Tuesday is now over. As we get all of our uh, team here at Fox 6 ready for reaction to bring you that uh, live here on Fox 6, let's check in first with Angelica Sanchez, who has been following this very closely. Angie, what was that moment like? Well, as you can imagine, it was very quiet as we were all uh, trying to listen in to hear uh, the verdict in this very high profile case. I'm actually inside the media room right now of the courthouse where currently we are setting up to see if Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger will speak to media following this case. But again, Kyle Rittenhouse not guilty on all charges against him. Now, I want to remind uh, the viewers that he originally faced more ch charges against him. And I think, did I just lose? I might have lost you on air. Well, as you can hear, clearly having some audio issues there uh, with Angelica Sanchez. We apologize for that. But as she was saying, hoping to hear remarks from the assistant district attorney, Thomas Binger, the lead prosecutor in this case, his brief comment to the judge after the counts were re read saying the jury has spoken, not the outcome he wished for, but it is a jury of peers of Kyle Rittenhouse. And we are expected to hear from Justin Blake, the uncle of Jacob Blake, uh, shortly on the steps of the courthouse about 1230 in reaction to this verdict. Uh, they had sent a, a release essentially before all of this had happened, saying that they would be speaking after the verdict has been read. And certainly more and more people are starting to show up to Kenosha County that has been the uh, focus for so many people on both sides, uh, supporters of Kyle Rittenhouse and those uh, obviously opposed to to his actions. And that's what started it all. It was Jacob Blake who was shot seven times by a Kenosha police officer in August of 2020 that led to days of protests, led to Kyle Rittenhouse and others going to Kenosha a couple days later. And eventually uh, in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that uh, very stressful time in Kenosha County and the city of Kenosha in particular, the nation watched as cars burned, as buildings burned and were looted and eventually learned that Kyle Rittenhouse had killed two people and injured another on that night, August 25th. That case then became another thing that the national eyes were focused on Kenosha for. How would this be determined? The 17-year-old that came to Kenosha with an AR-15 that night and ended up killing two people, injuring a third. The jury speaking and deciding his fate not guilty on all five counts. As a Carl, result let's of check in with the Blake family reaction outside on the Kenosha County Courthouse steps right now. One. The judge had his hand on the scale. He didn't allow pictures. He didn't allow videotapes in. He didn't allow, didn't allow, didn't allow. He was doing everything he could to allow this young man to leave his courtroom clear and free. It uh, put blinds over the eyes of the jurors, and maybe because he did that, they didn't see the evidence how they could have seen it. They say, I think if you hear a young man say, I can't wait to shoot somebody 30 or 40 days, and 40, 30 days later, you murder two people with that exact same weapon you said you would have? How can you be mad? This young man drinks, eats, and sleeps the rhetoric 
of Proud Boys, the Ku Klux Klan, the skinheads, talk about hurting African Americans and minorities all the time. He merely acted it out. And what came to his rescue? This racist ass government, the police, and everything that was involved in this case that did not ringtones plan from Trump's. The judge saying he doesn't like rallies, he calls them rioters. There's a big difference. So th he did, this was not a true, accurate carry of justice, and it led to this young man getting away because of it. For the, for the press behind you, just uh, give you a, just uh, one minute here. Uh, Justin, can you tell me, first of all, what was your reaction when you heard not guilty on all counts? Our heart's broken for their family. Where's Tanya? Our heart is broken for their family. We've given our total effort from Locke, Leaders of Kenosha, from Rainbow Push, from the Blake family to do everything that we could to prop them up. So all they had to do was worry about their families in this case. This is a tragic guy's day in the history of this country where we sweep away the charges of carrying an illegal weapon, which clearly was an illegal weapon for a 17-year-old to have, uh, not allowing certain evidence in that the jury, we're out here, we don't know what they saw, but we know what was denied for them to see. And if that denied them, carrying out justice, then it shows you that this was a total uh, uh, mockery of what justice should be. There's no way he should be going home. Our personal opinion is he should have been going to jail. So what do you think is going to happen in the streets here today? What, what sort of reaction do you expect? Well, man, I don't know. Everybody's going to be a little uh, uh, upset when they hear it. Understandably, this is the second shooting in this city that no charges was filed on. My nephew was shot seven times in the back by a police officer with his children sitting right there in the back seat. No charges were levied in this racist ass town. No charges are levied for the two young men that were out marching in support of Jacob Blake and what they saw. This is a, t I mean, for this city, county and state, you can't market this city anymore as the city by the lake. This is like a sundown town where you don't welcome minorities, where you don't welcome African Americans, and African Americans will know to stay the hell up out of here. Yeah. Just well, prior to the trial, you spoke about the prosecution not asking for a different prosecutor. What is your thought on that? And moments ago, the judge said he couldn't have worked with a better jury. You said what now? I'm sorry. After the verdict was read, the judge said he couldn't have worked with a better jury. I want you to respond to that. And do you think the outcome would have been different if the prosecution had to ask for a different uh, a judge? Well, I'm not even. Should have been a different. Should have been a different judge. Number one. Number two. Where's that loudmouth ass dude that said they were not going to prosecute my nephew? Why is he not involved with this? This was the second largest case in history of this city. He was all over the news for my nephew. Where the hell was that prosecutor at when this young man walked in there? Why was his hands not more involved in this case? Hey, Justin, real quick, um, uh, have you spoken to your nephew yet? No, I haven't. I'm going to talk to him later this evening. But again, I don't talk to him about this case. We talk about things. I'm his uncle first. Right. The judicial bias in this case speaks for itself. This jury was not sequestered. You were just hearing Yesterday, live the, the uncle of Jacob Blake, Justin Blake, speaking on the courthouse steps in reaction uh, to the five not guilty verdicts, all five counts for Kyle Rittenhouse. Justin Blake saying it was a total mockery of what justice should be, calling the decision of the jury. He said that he will be upset. He clearly upset by his remarks uh, there on the courthouse steps. Also calling uh, on a number of the previous things that have happened. Of course, the initial shooting of Jacob Blake, the decision that was found that Officer Rustin Chesky acted uh, was not guilty of anything, no charges against him following the shooting of Jacob Blake, and now Kyle Rittenhouse also found not guilty in his high-profile case as well. Uh, a description a little bit about what you're seeing here. Obviously, this case has received national attention. There are media outlets from all around the country that have descended on Kenosha, Wisconsin over the last few weeks covering this trial. Certainly even more that we saw this week awaiting the verdict. That's why our cameras, which were back a little bit, are not able to get a, a clear shot of Justin Blake there. We do want to go back to Angelica Sanchez, who has been inside the courthouse for the entire duration of this trial and was there as the judge read those five not guilty verdicts.
Angelica, if you're with us, uh, I'd love to ask you just your thoughts, your reaction to what happened over the course of the trial and then ultimately what led to the jury finding Kyle Rittenhouse not guilty. Well, this trial certainly lasted much longer than anybody had anticipated, lasting 15 days uh, total. I can tell you that the jury uh, throughout this entire process really had only one real question when it came to reviewing the evidence in this case, and that came down to that drone video that uh, many of us were talking about, that drone video where there was a dispute between the quality the prosecution had and the quality that the defense had. Now, of course, the prosecution uh, used that drone video that was their claim for provocation in this case. That's where they said that there was images that showed Kyle Rittenhouse pointing a weapon, which then led to that first fatal shooting. Of course, the defense disputed that uh, they were ever given the proper file. There was a lot of back and forth revolving around that. But again, it's very interesting. That was really the only piece of evidence that the jury really requested to review in this case. Uh, all the, the times that the jury was deliberating, they came into the courthouse, went straight straight to work. And again, today we were all wondering what kind of questions would they have. But really, just to point out, that was the only uh, piece of evidence that they really asked to review. So it makes you wonder how those provocation, uh, the prosecution asking for the jury to consider provocation, if that perhaps maybe led to the lengthiness of this trial. And of course, Kyle Rittenhouse has been cleared of all charges, found not guilty on all charges against him. And this is even with the prosecution adding lesser included offenses to some of the most serious charges uh, against him. In, in many ways, people thought that last uh, gasp from the prosecution trying to add those lesser charges was a sign that maybe they knew their convincing of the jury had not been successful at that point. What do you think some of the key moments of the trial were? Where did the defense really win over the, what started as a 20 person, then down to an 18 person jury, and ultimately the 12 members that decided Kyle Rittenhouse's fate? Well, I do believe that uh, for the defense to have Kyle testify in his own defense, I think that that was certainly a highlight. Many legal experts uh, would tell you that they advise against a defendant doing that in a case. So I think that that was uh, a surprise. Um, I think that another highlight in this was the uh, testimony from Gage Grosskreutz. Uh, that testimony certainly uh, became uh, something that the defense used uh, after uh, the prosecution and had him on the stand. So that was certainly another highlight in this trial. Uh, but of course, many people will remember uh, Kyle Rittenhouse taking the stand in his own defense. Uh, he was questioned. I think it was over six hours uh, that he gave testimony to what happened that night. So that was certainly a, a highlight in this trial. All right, Angelica, thank you very much. We'll uh, come back to you for more insight, more of your uh, experience covering this trial. But in the meantime, Suzanne, we want to switch gears here. Yeah, and just to kind of reflect here on the moment of what has happened, Kyle Rittenhouse found not guilty of five counts charged against him. Uh, Rittenhouse kind of collapsed there on the table next to his team of defense, uh, seemingly pretty emotional for him and also his mother, who sat two rows behind him. Uh, the judge, who has really uh, been a focus throughout this trial uh, in his courtroom, the way he runs things, uh, thanked the jury for their service, said that they have been attentive, said that they have been punctual, and even uh, you know thanking them for all of their service over the past three and a half days of deliberation and then all the testimony before that and they have a they've been doing their due diligence we can say that of the jury it, it, it's what they're asked to do it's what they have done as they did take those three and a half days we weren't sure how much longer this would go until a verdict was reached asking uh, to see a, a few pieces of video again as well that was one of the key moments this week the jury in the middle of deliberations wanted to look back at some of that video evidence um, to take a closer look at what exactly happened that night and we know in general for this case Suzanne how important video was uh, as we get into 2021 everyone has a camera in their pocket now. So much different video to parse, so many different angles to look at that both the prosecution and the defense used trying to make their case one way or the other in the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse. It, we are getting word here from our very own Aaron Maben, who has been inside uh, the courtroom during these proceedings, that the spokesperson for the Rittenhouse family is outside. We're working on uh, trying to take that moment uh, as it comes, as Anthony Huber's uh, family is also uh, outside. Certainly, this is an emotional moment 
moment, not only for those directly involved, but those impacted, the family members, uh, many friends who have stood outside, uh, been inside that courtroom, uh, certainly for the mother of Kyle Rittenhouse, who you could see kind of collapse in emotion there, a couple rows behind her son. And there were a number of moments for her, uh, certainly when her son took the stand. Uh, we remember that moment, of course, where Kyle Rittenhouse broke down describing the first shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum. Wendy Rittenhouse was in tears throughout much of that testimony, having to watch her trial on the her son on trial for homicide. And again today, Aaron Mabin, who was in the courtroom describing her and other family members in tears as they uh, tried to process what happened. As for Kyle Rittenhouse, he did immediately collapse when the final not guilty charge and count was read and then very quickly left the courtroom after that. He is a free man and left the courtroom as soon as possible. Let's go right now to Michael Hart, a local defense attorney uh, here in the Milwaukee area who is going to give us insight here in just a few minutes. Uh, in the meantime, taking another live look inside the courtroom uh, where we are about to hear some reaction. All of this happening in the moment, of course, and we will be here for you for all of it. This is a podium and a microphone set up where attorneys are expected to speak about the decision that was just reached by the jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, the, the then 17 year old, now 18 year old, not guilty on all counts. The moment that the attorney stepped to that podium, we will take that to you live. In the meantime, let's go back to Michael Hart. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this very historic day for Kenosha, for anyone impacted uh, by this case. Could you just talk about uh, your reaction uh, to five non guilty uh, verdicts for Kyle Rittenhouse? Look, it, it was a tall order for the state. Once the issue of self-defense was raised by the defense, the government had to prove, uh, disprove beyond a reasonable doubt that he didn't act in self-defense, and, and that proved at the end of the day to be too much. I will say this. I, I, I would say that the fact that there was the video uh, of the shooting, what we don't see in most homicide cases, probably saved Kyle Rittenhouse's life. And that really has been the key, uh, I think, for both sides. We were just discussing that. So many different pieces of video, so many different angles to draw on there. Do you think there was any one in particular that really could have swayed the jury, one that gave them kind of their, their lead, their marching orders on, on what would eventually be five not guilty verdicts? Well, you know, the image of uh, Huber uh, and the others attacking him with the a skateboard, the fella flying at him, you kick him in the head, right? That's pretty compelling stuff. Uh, yeah, it all contributed. And, 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 and the fact that he uh, responded the way he did at the end of the day proved to be too much for uh, the government to overcome in terms of the self-defense argument. The not guilty verdicts, Kyle Rittenhouse now released from bond. Um, how does Kyle Rittenhouse assimilate himself back into, you know, the real world, essentially, with these non guilty verdicts? Well, that's a fair question. I mean, Rittenhouse is a name probably not um, much different from Lewinsky. He's going to have to, you know, live. People know who Kyle Rittenhouse is around the country and, for that matter, around the world. Um, He's, he'll be saddled with that, and assimilating back into the community will be a challenge. But uh, life goes on, and uh, uh, hopefully he learned from the experience. Uh, it will guide him going forward in the choices and decisions he makes. Maybe he's emboldened. I, I don't know. But, but um, this is the first day of the rest of his life. We're sort of processing this all in the moment and we'll be able to uh, take a look back and evaluate things over the coming hours and days and weeks, I'm sure. But very quickly, or at least in your initial reaction to the verdict, where did the prosecution not succeed? What were they not able to prove? And were there elements of their case or witnesses they brought to the stand that you did not think were ultimately effective in swaying the jury? Well, the prosecution doesn't really get to pick its witnesses. You, you know, the, the facts are the facts. Uh, I always uh, commented from the beginning of the trial that each and every witness didn't seem to hurt the defense that much. So the prosecution brings forth the witnesses who saw and heard and observed and presented to the jury. I'm not sure the, the prosecution failed. Yet. They made some, some minor tactical errors. Certainly there were questions about uh, Mr. Binger's uh, arguments to the jury, which could be uh, second-guessed. Fair enough, but at the end of the day, the facts were what, what what was presented, and the jury found that there was 
uh, a lacking of evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to, to uh, prove it, and and that's the basis of the verdict. I have I have great faith in jurors, and I think that they took their time; they were deliberate. Uh, you know, you had five or six counts to, to deal with, five counts, I guess, at the end, uh, and a lot of uh, evidence and testimony to get through. Michael, I want to draw your attention to the fact uh, Kyle Rittenhouse was charged initially with seven counts. Two of those dropped the possession of a dangerous weapon uh, and, and also the charge over the emergency order violating the curfew. Uh, if those still were uh, on the table against him, could that have made a difference? Could, have, could he have even gotten a little bit of jail time or some sort of repercussion uh, if those were on the table? What is your sense? A sense is maybe, but this is a homicide trial. So if those charges remained and he was convicted of the misdemeanors and he did a handful of days or a handful of months in, in jail, I'm not sure there would have been any greater satisfaction for the prosecution or those who felt that he should have been convicted of the homicides. This is a homicide trial. And honestly, I question uh, the defense's motivation in seeking the dismissal of those misdemeanor charges, thinking that if the jury was going to compromise on some conviction, at least it ought to be a misdemeanor if I'm representing Mr. Rittenhouse, rather than one of these lesser included offenses. And, and for their uh, thinking all or nothing, um, worked out. But I, I did have some concerns that the jury might compromise. And since there wasn't a misdemeanor charge to compromise on, uh, there was a real risk that perhaps uh, they convict on one of these lesser included. Thank you very much for that perspective and uh, that expertise. Interesting to hear that uh, it was a bit of a gamble for the defense, but it has paid off. Kyle Rittenhouse, a free man, not guilty on all five of the ultimate counts that he faced. Michael Hart, a defense attorney with Hart Powell, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll be checking in with you over the, the time being. In the meantime, we want to get to uh, Aaron Maben, who you're seeing there, speaking with Anthony Huber's girlfriend, the late Anthony Huber, one of the two people shot and killed by Kyle Rittenhouse that night outside the courthouse along with his aunt. Any reaction to the verdict? Any reaction at all? Please stay off the parking lot. Okay. Off the parking lot. I'm oh, sorry. I'm just going to go right now. Mm. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Obviously, a very fluid situation. What you're looking at right now is Anthony Huber's family leaving the Kenosha County Courthouse uh, with law enforcement walking them safely to their car. Certainly, a, a very emotional moment for for them uh, and also for all of those impacted like by this case. As we work to get uh, Aaron Maben back, who was inside the courtroom during all of these proceedings, to get his take uh, on what he saw, kind of the expression, the emotion uh, from those jurors, Carl. It's important to. to to uh, consider the reporters who have been outside the whole time, right? Sure. Bill Miston, who uh, has been outside the courthouse covering this case for us. Uh, Bill, it has been uh, dozens more people have shown up since this verdict has been read. What is it like from your perspective? And again, working to uh, juggle a lot of walls here. We have a lot up in the air with reporters inside and outside the courthouse for you. There is Bill Miston outside the Kenosha County Courthouse. Bill, uh, we've chatted every single day on Fox 6 News 11 evening, about Suzanne. this uh, Good evening, Good afternoon, trial. Suzanne and Carl. Uh, we just got done uh, speaking. We just got done speaking with uh, uh, Justin Blake. That would be Jacob Blake's uh, uncle, as well as Bishop uh, Tavis Grant with the Rainbow Push Coalition out of Chicago. And uh, you could see a number of people still assembled here on the courthouse steps, uh, along with uh, Jacob Blake's uncle, Justin, there. Uh, and I asked uh, him what... Uh, what he would uh, be speaking to uh, Jacob Blake about. Obviously, uh, the shooting of Jacob Blake by a police officer in August of 2020 is what uh, essentially the catalyst for what uh, was uh, days of unrest and, and violence uh, and protests uh, here in the city of Kenosha that ultimately uh, brought uh, Kyle Rittenhouse here to the city that night in August. 
and that led, that predicated to those shootings. And uh, Justin Blake saying that first and foremost, he is an uncle to uh, Jacob Blake, and that that's his first duty. And second, uh, he said that there's going to be a lot to unpack, and they're going to have uh, a long talk about this. Uh, obviously, Jacob Blake had spoken about the trial uh, just a few days ago and his thoughts on it. And uh, even though this is not the uh, decision and outcome that they were hoping for uh, with uh, Kyle Rittenhouse being acquitted on these charges. Uh, they say that uh, there has been movement and the reason that they, that they have been out here uh, each and every day of this trial is that they wanted to show solidarity with those who were killed that night, with Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, as you uh, had just seen his family leaving in very fluid and emotional uh, day for them. So uh, today has been a, a, a much calmer day than it was yesterday. Uh, a lot fewer people out here, uh, a lot more media members out here. Um, at times there have been some opposing sides, those who uh, sided with Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, you know, thankful that obviously he was acquitted on these charges. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of emotions out here and a lot of thoughts of how this city will move forward uh, and, and what will happen here in the coming hours, days, weeks, months and obviously years. Bill, a quick question for you. I know obviously we're working with a delay because of so many people there in the area. Uh, in this situation, we have seen a couple dozen people outside the courthouse every day, but describe for us the scene, what's happening right now, the mood uh, among people outside the courthouse. Well, I think there's a sense of uh, resolve. Um, it, it's, it's not... Uh, you, you are you are hearing, uh, I believe, uh, someone talking on a loudspeaker right now. I believe uh, that would be uh, those who are uh, with uh, the Jacob Blake family. Uh, but as far as mood, again, it, it's it's it it's it's more so of a um, I think culmination, and I think there maybe was just kind of a, 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 a sigh of maybe relief. Uh, there wasn't any joyous cheering or clapping or or sobbing uh, regardless of which way you may come down on this it, it's it's kind of just watching and, and seeing how, how people are reacting to this and and calm calm bill thank you very much we'll continue to check in with you outside the courthouse and of course hope it remains calm there as well uh, we saw aaron maben following the family of anthony huber so we want to get back to you aaron uh, it was i believe his girlfriend and his aunt uh, didn't look like they chose to comment what was the entire scene like the mood like you saw from them on the other side of this verdict it was actually quite chaotic around them, just uh, media from all over, not only local but national, uh, walking out of the courthouse with them. I think there was a little bit said, I asked a question uh, to, to Anthony Huber's girlfriend, there was a lot of no comment, so I do got to look back at the tape, um, but they were basically silent. I have to say we're on the other side of the courthouse, and it took us some time, a good amount of time, because uh, just the amount of people that was surrounding him, his great aunt is a little bit older, she walks with a cane, so they had to make sure that she didn't trip over anyone's feet, so she was surrounded by deputies uh, from here in Kenosha County as they walked out of the courthouse, and then again, people just asking them a number of questions, but uh, mainly no comment, so they walked from uh, that side of the courthouse to this side, and it took them some time. Not many words. Obviously, they're still uh, emotional by this. I want to talk about before the verdict happened, there was Anthony Huber's girlfriend, his great aunt, and then also Joseph Rosenbaum's girlfriend. They were inside of the courtroom uh, right across from me where I was sitting in the courtroom. I was right behind Kyle Rittenhouse, and I think we knew a verdict was coming. We had a little bit of inkling because some deputies walked in and then walked them out of the courtroom so we think that there was some sort of chatter, possibly like, you know, when this verdict comes, we'll walk you out just like we saw, and then they walk back in. So that's how we had a little bit of inkling that a verdict was coming. Joseph Rosenbaum's girlfriend, shortly after, she was with some sort of security, maybe a friend. She was whisked outside of the courtroom a, a, a few minutes after the verdict came down. Anthony Huber's great aunt and his girlfriend, who we were just with, they went to the first level, so they walked downstairs, they went into a room uh, surrounded by deputies, and I believe it was just uh, those two and maybe a friend who we've seen them with all week long, and they were 
emotional and they just needed a moment to themselves before they walked outside of the courtroom. So that's uh, what we experienced. Again, they didn't really offer any comment. I do want to look back because his girlfriend did say a few words to the media. They were extremely frustrated, to be honest, by the amount of attention that they had been getting. Um, I talked to them yesterday. I talked to Susan Hughes yesterday. I talked to Hannah Giddings yesterday. Neither of them, uh, who was Anthony Huber's girlfriend, neither of them wanted to really predict the verdict, uh, but they were very upset as they walked outside of the court house today. Aaron, as we Carl, await a prosecution news conference in reacting to this verdict, I want to ask you about what we all have not seen, which is the faces of those jurors. You were inside the courtroom. Uh, when they described those non-guilty verdicts, when they read those aloud, what was that moment like? Yeah, it, there was a lot going on, so I wanted to make sure I was kind of staying present and looking at a lot of different people. My main focus um, was Kyle Rittenhouse, who was shaking in front of me, but Right away, I was pulled to his mom or his sister. I heard some sort of gasp once that verdict was read, and my ear just immediately shot over to them. They were emotional. It was Kyle Rittenhouse's mother, uh, the spokesperson for the Rittenhouse family, David Hancock, uh, some sort of another friend, and then his sister, all of them wearing black. They were emotional, too. And then I did look over at the jury. They seemed pretty stolid, very focused as a court official um, read those counts too. So a lot happening with Kyle Rittenhouse shaking and then falling as we all saw there uh, to the table. Then the mother or sister gasping as at first uh, uh, the first the verdict was read and I did look over to the jury. They were very serious. I got to say I was um, not sure what I was going to get out of them because they seemed a bit glazed over. I was able to see them at four o'clock uh, both mo uh, Tuesday and Wednesday of Wednesday and Thursday of this week, and they seemed glazed over, uh, very focused, and maybe a little bit ready to go home. So today I wasn't very sure what I was going to see uh, from them at all, but they did seem uh, very serious. They took this case very seriously, it appeared to me, Suzanne and Carl. They certainly did, and the judge uh, commending them for their attention throughout, their punctuality. Uh, two plus long weeks of trial and then three and a half days of deliberations until they eventually came to their verdict today. Kyle Rittenhouse not guilty on all counts. Let's check in with Angelica Sanchez, who is live inside the Kenosha County Courthouse uh, with what she's seeing at this point. Well, right now I'm in the media room still where we are waiting to see if Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger will be speaking to the media following the outcome of this case. So there is a lot going on to the sides of the camera that you cannot see right now. But again, we are waiting to see if the prosecution will talk about the outcome of this case. Now, this trial lasted 15 days. Now, again, we were, we were told that this trial was not going to go this long, but it all came down to jury deliberations. As I mentioned before, it really makes you wonder the role that that drone video that was submitted during the trial, what that uh, drone video did uh, in terms of like how this jury uh, ended up weighing in on Kyle Rittenhouse's, uh, ch the charges that he faced uh, in this trial. So uh, really with that drone video, something that we know is that there was a large dispute between the prosecution and the defense between the quality of this video and uh, whether the prosecution was aware aware that the copy that they gave the defense was different than the copy that they possessed. The jury, this was the only piece of evidence that the jury requested to see. They saw it for about an hour, uh, and there was a lot of debate between the defense and objections between whether how they should see this video, how long they should see this video, and of course, this is the video that the prosecution claimed showed Kyle Rittenhouse pointing his weapon prior to the first fatal shooting. And of course, the prosecution, uh, that's where they uh, put probably provocation uh, charges for the provocation for the jury to consider during uh, their during jury instructions. Uh, and of course, that uh, drone video was played over and over again. The judge allowed the jury to watch that video, but it really makes you think the role that that drone video had in the outcome of this trial. Again, Kyle Rittenhouse found not guilty on all charges against him. 
As this trial progressed, I want to remind our viewers that several charges against him were dropped. He was originally charged with seven uh, charges, and that included uh, having a gun under the age of 18. That included the curfew, uh, violating the curfew hours. Uh, the prosecution uh, charged him with that, and the defense fought against that curfew. That was the first one to drop. And then, of course, the defense, uh, they argued ambiguity in the state statute for that gun charge that Kyle Rittenhouse uh, faced, and that was dropped. Uh, so he faced five charges in this trial. The most severe would have sent him away uh, life in prison without the possibility of parole. Uh, so you really have to uh, give it to the jury who, you could tell, took their time uh, deliberating uh, on these charges and understanding uh, just how crucial it was to review what they could. And again, the only piece of evidence that they really requested was that drone video uh, that the prosecution was adamant about showing the jury that this was going to show uh, Kyle Rittenhouse uh, caused this entire incident. Uh, so we are waiting for Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger uh, to come down here. And of course, that's one of the questions. If he does choose to speak with us, that's a question that we will ask is his thoughts on that drone video and the role that it played in deciding the outcome of this trial. Angelica Sanchez, thank you very much uh, for all your work throughout the course of the trial, keeping us updated here at the station while you were in the courthouse there. As you can imagine, a number of different reactions pouring in from all around the country, all around Wisconsin to this case that has received national attention. And Suzanne, uh, we have no better than our political reporter Jason Calvi to comment on some of that. We're seeing statements already from Brian Stile, the congressman from that part of Wisconsin, as well as Gwen Moore. And there is Jason Calvi now joining us outside the Kenosha County Courthouse. Jason, uh, obviously this trial meant a lot more to a lot of people around the country than just uh, the outcome here today. What are some of the reactions coming in from our elected leaders? Yeah, we're getting uh, reactions from a flood of Wisconsin elected leaders, and we can expect that that will be coming in all day long. I want to go first to Representative Gwen Moore. She represents Milwaukee. Uh, she put out a tweet, and, and take a look at what she tweeted. This is what, what she tweeted just right after the verdict came down. She wrote, a system that legitimizes vigilante murder, in her words, is deeply broken. Again, that's Representative Gwen Moore of Milwaukee, Congresswoman Gwen Moore. We also heard from Senator Ron Johnson. I want to put up his tweet now and, and share a totally different perspective from what we heard from Glenn Moore. Senator Johnson saying, I believe justice has been served in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. I hope everyone can accept the verdict, remain peaceful, and let the community of Kenosha heal and rebuild. So there's two of the different perspectives from Senator Johnson, Republican, and Representative Moore, a Democrat. Uh, what we're hearing also is uh, police. We've been talking to police leaders here in Kenosha, the Kenosha, Kenosha County Sheriff yesterday talked about they were analyzing intelligence, they were getting all the intelligence working with their federal, state, and local leaders to put together, uh, law enforcement to put together the intelligence, and they said right now, that, or at least yesterday, there was the intelligence was not showing that much was going on as far as possible threats or dangers, but just as a precautionary measure, uh, Governor Evers did activate and uh, mobilize 500 National Guard's troops. Uh, they've been stationed and standing by both in Sussex, in Waukesha County, as well as in Milwaukee County, and they will be um, moving out once the local police here ask for that help, once they ask them. And according to some military sources, that call has not been made as of right now, but we could expect that that call will be made as the, the potential for security, just having extra security in place here in Kenosha. We know that the schools have also, the schools closest to the courthouse have closed down for the past few days, including today, including, uh, if we can move the camera, Jeff, uh, just move the camera right over here. Courthouse is right here, but over here in this corner is actually, uh, that's a school building. There's two Kenosha Unified Public Schools in that building, just some of the five uh, in Kenosha that have closed down or moved to virtual learning in light of what's going on at the courthouse across the street with the protests and all of the media coverage and the fact that many students have to walk to school every day. So they, they just took that precautionary step. They said there was no eminent danger, but they wanted to make that precautionary step to, to move to virtual learning and close down uh, in-person learning as up through today through Friday. So for now, we're live in Kenosha. Jason Calvi, Fox 6 News.
Jason, I'll ask you one follow-up question, if you don't mind. Uh, you mentioned the National Guard, and it's impossible not to remember the images that we saw in Kenosha in those days following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Cars burned out, tear gas used in that park behind you and outside the courthouse with fencing up all over. A very different scene than what we're seeing right now in the wake of the verdict, just a mere moment, it's not even an hour since that verdict was read. Can you describe again what it would take for the governor to call in the National Guard, what it would take from local authorities to need that assistance, which is on standby, but it is currently not in Kenosha? Right, so Sheriff Bath yesterday said that they didn't want to call up the National Guard. It's only really as a last resort if we saw what we saw last year where there was the looting and, and the violence and the, the fires, the, the car the, the car source, uh, used car lot lit on fire, all those cars destroyed. Um, that was last year, and, and Sheriff Beth says he doesn't want to call the National Guard unless it really is a, until it's a last resort. Uh, but they have been activated, so they are on standby. Governor Evers has activated 500 National Guard troops, so they are ready to go. They've been uh, training. We've, we've seen them uh, in Sussex where they were uh, practicing uh, various maneuvers with batons and shields and things like that, crowd control maneuvers that they might have to use. But if they are called, uh, they have certain responsibilities that they can and cannot do. One of them would be to protect uh, what's called critical infrastructure. So that could be the courthouse, that could be uh, you know, various built government buildings. They could protect those buildings. They could also assist police and the fire department. So uh, we've seen the National Guard in the past when there's been uh, you know, unrest in places like Milwaukee where we've seen the National Guard uh, going out and, and helping, for example, with the fire department just to secure their mission as they go out to put out fires and things like that. So those are the things that they may be doing, but in order for them to actually get to Kenosha, the local police here, the sheriff or the local police department would need to call them in to uh, to, to, to activate them here and to, on, uh, to come here to Kenosha. And we certainly hope that is not needed. We certainly hope things remain calm there. Jason Calvey, thank you very much for your reporting. We should mention uh, Jacob Blake, the man himself uh, who eventually this sort of led to everything from the police shooting Jacob Blake. He did an exclusive interview with TMZ earlier this week. He was asking for peace as well, no matter what verdict was reached in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. We are within the hour of the not guilty verdict for Kyle Rittenhouse. We are now going to send things over to our colleagues, Stephanie Grady, Ben Handelman, to take things over from here. Appreciate it, guys. We're coming up on 1 o'clock in Kenosha County, Wisconsin. Not guilty on all counts. We heard it about 45 minutes ago. That's when the gasps were heard inside the courtroom. It's taken 15 days for this entire Kyle Rittenhouse trial. On this fourth day of deliberations, though, about 24 hours later, we finally do have those verdicts. We weren't sure if it was going to end in a mistrial, a hung jury, because it had taken so long, Ben. And, you know, we've been speaking with experts all week long as this trial has gone on. They weren't sure which way it would go. Nobody can guess except those 12 jurors. And tonight we do know, in fact, that uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, not guilty, going home with his family. We have several crews in Kenosha right now. We do want to tell you we are awaiting a press conference. Now, it is interesting because just a couple days ago, the, uh, the prosecutors came out with a, a statement saying they would not hold a press conference. So we do not know if we'll see them in front of a microphone. What we do know, we have a camera pointed at a microphone. We are expecting attorneys to show up there. And we do expect to hear from Kyle Rittenhouse's defense. Let's go out to Aaron Mabin. He is on the scene right outside the courthouse. He was there inside the building. Aaron, this did not play out as we expected. We expected this to get uh, an hour notice once the, the verdict came in. And after all of that waiting today, this happened very quickly. Yeah, Ben, I just want to let you guys know that I'm right outside of the courthouse right now, uh, kind of in this park. We're near uh, David Hancock, who is a spokesperson for the Rittenhouse family. So once he finishes up with uh, another network, we are going to try to walk over to him and get a live interview with him, uh, hoping to find out if he talked to Kyle Rittenhouse uh, uh, before the verdict came down or after the verdict came down. Uh, we just finished talk, or walking with the uh, girlfriend and the great aunt of Anthony Huber, Susan and Hughes and Hannah Giddings, they really didn't have much to say. There was a lot of emotion that they had inside of the courtroom. Uh, they took some time uh, together and then they were ushered out of the courthouse and walked to their car just uh, crushed by people locally and nationally as well. Uh, let me just walk over. Hi. Hey. I'm with... I'm with Fox Milwaukee. We're live now. Can I just borrow you really quick? Yeah, of course. I want to know, uh, th 
yeah, I'm live, by the way. Sorry, so just want to let you know. Um, David Hancock with uh, the spokesperson for Kyle Rittenhouse and his family. You were sitting next to Wendy Rittenhouse as the uh, verdict came in. What was her reaction? What was your reaction to the verdict? One of relief. Um, it's been a long road. And uh, so we believe that that was the right verdict. We believe that the length of time was the jury being very careful in reading the instructions and looking over the evidence. Um, but look, there, there's no spiking a football. There's two people did lose their lives. There was, uh, there was a lot of things that infected this case, like politics, that, that that's sent it off the rails really early on. And so there are no winners. I mean, Kyle now gets to live his life as a free young man, an innocent young man, which he is. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, there are no winners. There's been, there's been, this is a, I believe this is a inflection point for this country that, that we should try to bridge the divide right now. Uh, and we should try to come together, right? This is a moment that I think the country can use um, to get united, to try to get united, to have conversations, to sit across the table. Have you talked to Kyle at all Not since the verdict came? No, 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 no. They left uh, immediately. They left immediately. They went out the back door uh, for security reasons. We wanted to get him off site. So, what's next for him? College. College. He he can be an 18 year old young man. Uh, he's a, he's studying prerequisites at Arizona State University, and for nursing, and he's going to continue that. And um, we're going to do everything we can to to make sure he can live as normal of a life moving forward as now. Um, sorry, as possible, um, but I think you're going to see some some good things that come out of Kyle in the future because he's a very, very pragmatic young man, right? That's been through a lot, and uh, there's just there's so many pieces of this case that touch every issue in modern day contemporary politics, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, this case was always about self-defense and nothing else. It wasn't about politics. It was not about race. It was a case about did he defend himself when attacked? And uh, he absolutely did. And thank God that the jury came to that conclusion. But look, I'll say it again. Um, there are no winners in this. But this is an opportunity to have some discussions that I think should have should be had. And David Hancock, Channel 12 in Milwaukee here, ABC. Um, we're live as well, and I just want to introduce you to our viewers. You've been with the Rittenhouse family this whole time, and I was in the courtroom and I saw you, Wendy, really kind of held on to your arm tightly. What did you feel from her in that moment when they read the verdict? Uh, relief. I mean, a year and some odd months of just having... Uh, just having her son be defamed, for lack of a better term, but just be assaulted with just untrue things and comments and assumptions. And uh, she knows what's in Kyle's heart and what's in his head, as do I. Since I picked him up on November 20th, I know, and everybody in that room, all his family know the kind of person Kyle is. And so um, to get the verdict was just, I mean, I'm still trying to kind of reconcile it all in my head right now, but uh, she knows her son is going to be coming home, and she knows her son will always be coming home now, right? So, and he's been judged to be innocent. He's not guilty of what has... so. Uh, Kind of bumbling too, but uh, <laughs> and yeah. um, you did you see his reaction at all? 
you almost could kind of hear him hit the yeah. table. His yeah. knees may be buckling. Did you catch that at all? It's been a long, yeah, it's been a long road. It's been, it's been a long road. And uh, I'm just, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of the family for staying strong. Uh, God bless Mark and Corey. The defense team just nailed it. Uh, but to that that point, I think there's some issues that need to be looked at in terms of the prosecution and things that they did, what they attempted, and uh, hopefully that will be looked into in the coming months. Do you? It's always risky to put the defendant. There was the never stand. a doubt. There was he never was a always going to take the stand. Do you he think that? that wanted to take he wanted to take the stand sorry to cut you off but he always wanted to take the stand because he wanted to tell his story what he experienced how he felt there was there was never a doubt that he was going to take the stand do you think that played a huge role in this verdict uh i would own words i would think yes um because then you strip away everything else you strip away everybody calling him a racist and a white supremacist, and you strip away everybody else trying to tell the world his intent, right? Why he was there, who he is, the kind of young man he wants to be in the future. You get rid of all of that, all right? And he tells his story, and he was always committed to doing that, period. For people who don't know Kyle, you've, you've got a chance to really know him. Uh, what do you want people to know about him? right now what i think came out in court was was the things that were being reported about him were 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 not factual or true ever since the 25th of august of last year he is a caring he's an empathetic and he's a civic minded young man uh, and so i think you're going to see some good things out of kyle coming up because I was telling them, he's very pragmatic about what has happened over the past year, right? So uh, he's got some things to say, and I think, I think, I think you're going to be even more surprised by who Kyle actually is as he gets, as more people get to know him better. Can How is Kyle feeling before the verdict and then after the verdict? Uh, relieved. I mean absolutely relieved because because this this has been a long road it's been a long road uh but look he is a innocent and he can live a free life now but there are there are no winners in this 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 case has divided so many different parts of america that that had nothing to do with the fact whether or not he defended himself when being attacked. That was, that, that's what this case has always been about. Did he defend himself when he was attacked? What did your team make of four days of deliberations? We took it as this jury was being very cerebral and they understood the gravity of this decision. I mean, you can't overlook just how serious this case was and is to this nation right now at this time with this all these politics going like you can't overlook that so they wanted i believe that they wanted to make sure that this was the right decision and so personally um i appreciated that and i never felt one way or the other that it was going on for two or three or four days that just told me that they were being thoughtful so how do we repair the divisions in this community in the country that are so apparent to you that you just discussed well i think that's the question right i think that's the question for everybody yeah yeah it, it, but the problem is 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 the question is never asked like what you just said that's never what people are talking about. Nobody asks each other, how do we repair the divisions in this country? It just, it just keeps going, right? Will it take some time for him to get back to a normal life? I think so. Will, 
there, will there be a security concern for a while? Of course. What's next for him? Of course, college. Uh, do you know where? Uh, at Arizona State University. I mean, think about it. Uh, this case became so uh, so politically charged that when Kyle was on the stand and he said, I go to Arizona State University, I want to study nursing. Like, and then people call up Arizona University and then they say, oh, he's lying on this. No, the happiest I've ever seen Kyle in the past year and three months, besides when he got his puppy Milo, was when he got his Arizona State student ID in the mail. Right, that was the happiest I've ever seen him. So uh, it's things like that. It's that kind of vitriolic uh, nonsense, right, that, that I think as a nation we are at a inflection point. And that stuff needs to be addressed here in the future. Would you say he's looking for a fresh start, like a do-over at, you know, with what happened? Uh, by Fred... Like, well, he is almost in effect. He is having a fresh start. Like, but like everything that has been said about him, everything that's been reported about him, that has just not been true. I mean, that's going to linger. All of that, that nonsense, that that, excuse me, but that garbage that was reported about who he is, right? That he's a white supremacist. That he's a militia member. That he's all this stuff. But that's that, that's going to follow him around, and everybody found out that that was all not true. So um, he has a new normal, right? This is definitely going to be a new normal for him. And uh, but I think you're going to see some amazing things out of young Kyle here in the next few years. Is there anything that, you think Kyle wish he wishes he would have done differently on that night? I don't think Kyle wanted to be drug through the mud over the past year and a half. So done differently in the sense of does he wish he would have left? Well, he tried. He tried to leave. It's on video. Right? Um, that was not reported about like I'm not vitriol I'm not angry I'm very relieved at this decision finally right um, but I think it's an issue when the fact that he tried to leave when it's on video all over YouTube nobody said hey this young man tried to leave this situation he went up to the police and he tried to return back to that other car source. That was never reported on. That's huge, right? Um, if we go back, I don't, I don't really want to rehash the case, but people are still reporting that the young man crossed state lines with a weapon. Right? That, that, that was disproven by the state of Illinois themselves two weeks after. And it just kept getting reported on and reported on and reported on. And look, I'm not here to, uh, I think that kind of stuff needs to be looked at a little bit deeper. Like there's a responsibility to provide the correct and the accurate information. And I don't think that was done from the beginning of this case. And that infected this case all the way down until trial. And how did you become involved? In You've been listening live right there to David Hancock. He is the um, spokesperson I've for the Rittenhouse family. Just giving the media a, a chance to ask questions and get reaction as to how Kyle Rittenhouse, his mother, how the rest of the family are feeling after hearing the fact that Kyle Rittenhouse is getting to go home. He's headed off to college, to Arizona State University to study nursing. He's now a free young man. And the spokesperson did say there's no spiking the football, saying there are no winners here. Not guilty on five counts. Let's take you to the moment where this all played out in court. David Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse. That's the first count of the information, Joseph Rosenbaum. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, 
we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Members of the jury, are these your unanimous verdicts? You see Kyle Rittenhouse's reaction there right there to hearing the that he is found not guilty on all five counts. Now, he initially faced more counts than that, but some of those charges uh, were okay. dropped as the trial proceeded. Fifteen days, Ben, this trial took, and it was today on day four of deliberations and, uh, that I, we I learned, in fact, that Kyle Rittenhouse is going home tonight. Joining us right now, Jonathan, Jonathan Smith, a defense uh, attorney with Cohen Smith Roth. Attorney, thank you so much for joining us again. Your thoughts on the verdict today? Well, um, you know, I, I think that this is really where the evidence pointed uh, in this case. And I know that there's been a lot of uh, emotion surrounding this um, with um, some feelings on sort of both sides of the equation. But I think having watched a, a good portion, I, I admittedly I didn't see every bit of the the trial, but having watched a good portion of the trial, it certainly seemed that this is where the evidence pointed. So, um, and the jury has spoken, and, and that's just part of the process. Where did the decision come down to? Burden of proof. That's what this came down to. Did he? Did the state make a burden of proof against self-defense? That didn't seem to happen. Yeah, I think that's correct. I I, I thought from the evidence standpoint that uh, the first count with respect to Mr. Rosenbaum was perhaps a little bit. Uh, the, or, or the trickiest count uh, for the defense um, and, and something that, uh, you know, if the state was able to establish that, um, that, that maybe some of the other, um, uh, you know, charges would have followed suit. And I think that's why the state spent a lot of time in closing arguments on uh, the Rosenbaum matter. And that's where we get all this drone footage and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, ultimately, it, it became their burden once self-defense was uh, uh, introduced into this case, and um, clearly the jury, um, the jury said that that they didn't meet that. And and further, you know, keep in mind that the jury also considered lesser included, uh, uh, or had the potential to consider lesser included in charges, and uh, nevertheless, they came back not guilty on all counts. Let's talk a little bit about how much video played a role in this case. It is the 21st century. Everyone has a cell phone, and there was so much video evidence in this cell phone video, as well as some of that drone footage. Talk a little bit about uh, Mr. Smith here about how video plays such a role nowadays. Now that it's everywhere, everyone's being recorded. Yeah, we really are getting it from everywhere. Um, you know, it started sort of with police body camera footage, people now using their cell phones. Uh, I just have I have a number of cases right now where there's a ring doorbell footage. Um, and so video is showing up everywhere. But the interesting thing about video, of course, is usually um, when it's uh, sometimes just the cell phone video uh, or here the drone video or, or whatnot is, is oftentimes, I shouldn't say usually, oftentimes, you know, it shows us what happened, but not necessarily uh, provides the larger context or, or provides um, sort of a narration of, of what has gone. So certainly, you know, the old adage that, that, that a picture, and in, I suppose this case, a video is worth, you know, a thousand words. Uh, but nevertheless, it's still, as we saw in this case, people had to come in and explain what they were doing at this moment in time. I'm aware that some of the video had sort of a contemporaneous play by play, if you want to call it. Uh, that, but um, yeah, I think it's just a part of the justice system now that that in many cases that we're going to have uh, just a lot of video. And of course, there were a lot of people out on the street uh, that night, and so there were a lot of different individuals taking video for whatever purposes they were taking them for. Uh, and my understanding is, you know, law enforcement did their best to round up as much as much of it as they could. I'm sure uh, to a degree the defense put out feelers saying anyone have video uh, that hasn't been seen. And um, and of course, people were sort of live streaming or, or uploading it right as things were happening. So uh, I think that's just the way of the future going forward. Jonathan, this jury was able to do something that society was not able to do. They got 12 people in a room together, and they all agreed on the same thing with this case. I mean, you walk down the street and you ask 12 different people, you might get 12 different kind of answers. It's amazing 
how our justice system, despite some flaws that I have been pointing out from time to time, is able to do that. As this went on, some people were wondering if this would be a hung jury, but that didn't happen. Yeah, I, you know, certainly there's always room for improvement within the justice system, right? But I'm a person who has uh, great faith in the jury system. I think it's the best uh, system that we have going uh, around the world. And, um, you know, I, sometimes I get adverse verdicts and, and I disagree with them, but I usually don't challenge the fact that the jurors took their job seriously and focused on the evidence and, um, and you know, came, came to their conclusion. And, and so I, I do think, I hope that people can understand and respect this uh, verdict. I understand people have problems with the larger issue of, sure, he, he never should have been out there in the first place. And, and why did, you know, why is someone able to open carry a long gun and, and things like that? And those debates will continue. But at least as to, you know, I don't think this jury should be criticized. They were given a certain compendium of evidence. Uh, that they viewed uh, the admissible evidence that, that that was put forth in the trial that they view they applied the law we heard last night that some or all I guess took home their jury instructions to to, to study them so clearly they were taking it seriously so I, I think um, well folks may disagree uh, on some level I think they have to respect the jury and respect the jury process you hinted at this just a couple of moments ago do you think the prosecution potentially would have had a different outcome if they would have pressed different charges? These charges were ascending in nature, and we've seen cases like this before where the jury finds, uh, you know, the suspect acquitted on the charges that are in front of them. But if the prosecution would have came with different charges, it maybe would have had a different outcome. Do you see that at all playing a role in this case or not so much? I, I, you know, I, I think that there's an aspect to that. Listen, I've never been a prosecutor, right? Uh, I've viewed things from the defense standpoint uh, my entire career. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to, you know, be critical of, of the Kenosha DA's office in terms of the charges that they uh, sought to bring. I think, you know, to my mind, from my uh, from a defense attorney standpoint, I thought that there was some overreach on some of the charges, particularly as we started to see uh, footage come out. Um, it seems like the charges came came forward pretty quickly before all the evidence was available. So it seemed um, uh, or certainly understood to be. And so certainly, uh, you know, I think that they they may have overreached a little bit early on, but they were uh, I don't want to say stuck, but they had a position that they they tried to maintain uh, with respect to the charges. Um, but. You know, it's it's the nature of the process for them. The average jury comes to a verdict in two to four hours. This took four days. Were you surprised by how, the length of this? Well, it was a lengthy trial, so there was a, a quite a bit of evidence for them to go through, and and presumably that's what they did. And then then there's you know comes the discussion uh, standpoint or uh, aspect of uh, deliberation. So uh, it was a little surprising. I think when we spoke yesterday, I, I kind of pointed to the fact that. Um, you know, the weekend is coming and that um, uh, not that they were going to rush to judgment or, or sacrifice their opinions on that. But it is sort of, I think, forces people to sort of hone in and focus on on the discussions and, and come to their conclusion. You know, the jury was asked, hey, uh, do all of you still agree with these verdicts uh, having now been read in court? And all said yes. So, uh, again, presumably they took their job very seriously. It's a lengthy deliberation. I've had three day juries before. Um, you know, this spilled into a fourth day um, and, and not a, on a lengthy and serious and important case like this, um, you know, perhaps it was just the right amount of time. I want to get your take and maybe you don't want to give me your opinion on this, but Judge Bruce Schrader, who's actually the longest serving circuit court judge in the state of Wisconsin, he's made a little name for himself during this trial and maybe not for some great reasons. He's received a lot of criticism uh, throughout the 15 days of the trial. Can I get your take on some of the things that went down? Sure. I mean, I, it, so first of all, uh, this is a, a judge in, uh, that I appear or have appeared in front of and, and do appear in front of and expect to again. Um, and, and as a member of the bar, you know, we, we have to be a little bit careful um, on, on matters just as, as a matter of uh, uh, rule. Uh, but, you know, Judge, I, I think some of it has been unfair. 
I think uh, a lot of the criticism or, or you know, people who have um, trumpeted his, his rulings, again, have seemed to have broken down a little bit along the sort of uh, socio-political uh, type lines. Um, you know, quite frankly, I was watching uh, some of his uh, evidentiary rulings. I think that he was correct. Um, I understand some people took issue with the temperament, with perhaps how he was addressing Attorney Binger uh, with respect to, um, you know, commenting on post-silent or post-arrest silence. Um, but, you know, they're human, judges are human too. They get exasperated sometimes. They get tired. They're put in long days. You know, when, when the jury goes home at five, the, the judge and the lawyers, they don't go. Uh, they're, they're usually working pretty late into the night. Certainly the lawyers are, and I'm sure the judge is reviewing matters for the following day. So, you know, certain things can build up and boil over, but from a, from a ruling standpoint, um, I, I think that he has been spot on. And, 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 you know, much has been made about his initial ruling that uh, they couldn't refer to these uh, individuals as victims in this case. And that has been a longstanding policy uh, for him. And quite frankly, uh, I and other defense attorneys have brought that motion in other courts saying, Judge, a person shouldn't be labeled as a victim until, uh, and unless and until uh, someone is established to have committed a crime. Um, and, and, and we're talking about the victim sense within the, the context of a criminal case, right? Certainly a person who suffers a gunshot wound is a victim of a gunshot wound, but are they a victim of a crime? And so, um, you know, I, I don't think that it was that unusual. I think people, unfortunately, can see into it what they want to see into it uh, about his rulings. But um, he's a pretty thoughtful judge. I don't always agree with him, and I've tangled with him uh, myself from time to time. Uh, but uh, I don't think that people should ascribe um, ill motives towards him or some type of agenda. Uh, because I, I think that that's uh, unfair. We all get rulings from judges in every case. Obviously, sometimes we like them, sometimes we don't. But, but you know, you take it and you move forward. Jonathan Smith, a defense attorney, appreciate that uh, instant reaction there as we come up at 1.30 here in the afternoon. Our Angelica Sanchez has been following this case since the very beginning. We want to get out to her live just to kind of go over everything that we've gone through over the last 15 days, what you've seen inside the courtroom, what you've seen outside the courthouse, because it's been a scene there as well, Angie. Well, and I want to talk about the jury since we're uh, sort of on that topic earlier uh, with the last speaker. We do know that the jury has left the courthouse. So uh, right outside where I am in the media room, there's a hallway and there were divided curtains, lots of security uh, out there guarding this uh, jury. So we first saw the six alternates exit through a side entrance of the courthouse. And then we saw that 12 person jury. I know nobody wanted to comment on this case. I could tell some jurors had their faces covered. Uh, you can imagine this has been stressful uh, for them once they pr uh, presumably realized the gravity and the weight of the decision that they had to make. So uh, nobody took any reporter's cards. Nobody wanted any contact information. That jury made sure uh, to leave. And of course, they had lots of security with them. I also want to point out it's becoming quite clear we are not going to hear from the prosecution today. We've been down here waiting for uh, maybe about an hour now and it seems like they have also left. Who we may be hearing is from the defense, which I am told they will be having a press conference at uh, Mark Richards' office, Attorney Mark Richards' office uh, in Racine. So uh, hopefully we will have uh, and hear from them, but it has become clear that the prosecution uh, is not going to be speaking on the outcome of this case. And, you know, if we want to go back, this is uh, 15 days of trial, of a very lengthy trial, much longer than anyone had anticipated. The the prosecution had the longest testimony and a lot of legal experts weighed in that at some point some of the uh, witnesses on the stand for the prosecution ended up uh, becoming uh, some of the best self-defense or um, evidence for the defense in this case the defense really their testimony uh, timeline was uh, just under the two to three days uh, in this trial that jury obviously very attentive listening to uh, the evidence that was presented taking four days for deliberation so you can imagine that they are breathing a sigh of relief ready to go home and move on with their lives again that jury has left the courthouse they were heavily guarded by security and no one wanted to speak to reporters
Okay, Angelica Sanchez, we appreciate it. Yeah, we were expecting to hear from the prosecution because they did send out a, a press release a couple days ago. There's the moments. Kyle Rittenhouse found out he was not guilty on all five counts. Let's go out to Bill Miston outside the courthouse. There was a lot of concern what might happen after the verdict was read. What's the scene like out there, Bill? Well, then what I really want to just touch on first is that uh, there were some people on the courthouse steps, and it appears that a woman who was here had a, a medical episode of some sort, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, different groups that were out here immediately surrounded her and started to help her. As you can see, uh, paramedics are now here on the scene uh, and loading her onto a gurney and going to be loading her into the back of an ambulance where uh, I presume she'll be taken to uh, uh, the hospital, which is uh, just down the street, uh, to get checked out. Um, so that is what you're seeing right now. It has remained uh, calm out here since that verdict was read uh, shortly after uh, noon, so about an hour and a half ago. Uh, what we can uh, tell you right now, again, what you're seeing right now um, is that there's a woman who appeared to have some sort of uh, medical episode uh, out here outside of the courthouse. And let's pan away so that way uh, we don't show, uh, so we don't show her. All right, Bill Miston reporting live right there. And as our camera, we just want to give a little bit of privacy there because we do know, at least according to Bill's uh, observation, that a woman had some sort of a medical emergency there on the steps. But Ben, the good news to kind of hear from Bill there, you know, we've seen a lot of divisiveness from protesters on both sides of this case for two weeks now. But to hear from Bill that when this woman had some sort of a medical emergency and we don't know what side she was on or if she wasn't on any side at all, everyone rushed to help her. So that, that's a little bit of good news that we want to pass along. The people are coming together despite all the divisiveness. This is a very emotional case. I was watching Cassidy Williams' story last night, and I was interested to hear that many of the protesters on both sides last night said we have to find a way to bridge the gap between our differences because this case is going to end and one side's not going to be happy, but we're all going to have to live together. And it appears that is happening out there. It's been a calm scene, emotional for sure. Uh, and obviously there's some concern right now with what's happening, but it's been much calmer than I think a, a lot of people expected. Okay, let's go straight to the verdict. We want to bring you back into the courtroom. This is the moment when Kyle Rittenhouse learned his State of Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse. That's the first count of the information, Joseph Rosenbaum. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Members of the jury, and you see uh, it there, Kyle Rittenhouse reacting to hearing that he is not going to be going to prison. He was facing a mandatory life sentence if he was convicted on the most serious charge. He was facing a total of five charges. It took the jury more than 26 hours to come back with this verdict on day four of deliberations. And inside the courtroom for most of this trial are Aaron Maben. Aaron, I know that you were there when the verdict was read. Yes, yeah, Stephanie, I want to talk about a little bit before that verdict was read. I think we knew that there was something coming because we saw a lot of the key players walking into the courtroom. Obviously, the attorneys on both sides were there. But then there was Wendy Rittenhouse, his two sisters, and also the Rittenhouse spokesperson. I have not seen Wendy Rittenhouse all week. So this was the first time she was seated inside of the courtroom since the jury began deliberating. We also saw Anthony Huber's girlfriend, his great aunt, and then Joseph Rosenbaum's girlfriend. Uh, on the other side, we knew something was coming because some deputies actually walked inside of the courtroom, then they ushered them out and had some sort of conversation with them. My theory is that they told them that a verdict is coming and we're going to whisk you out right away, which they did. When the verdict was read, you saw how Kyle Rittenhouse reacted. He started shaking and then fell down to the table. 
I was able to focus on that a little bit, but immediately my ear shot over to, I believe it was Wendy Rittenhouse or maybe one of his sisters who made some sort of gasp or some sort of squeak. Uh, the judge had already said he really didn't want any reaction, but this is a mom and a sister. They're obviously going to react. So I'm looking over at them and you can see Wendy Rittenhouse just holding on tight to David Hancock, who's a spokesperson for the Rittenhouse family. So they were uh, certainly going through a lot at that moment. And then everyone really started moving at one point. The Rittenhouse team was whisked out of the courthouse. Uh, I stay close actually to Anthony Huber's girlfriend and his great aunt. And they uh, spent some time in a room on the first floor of the courthouse before they walked outside of the front doors there. You can see there's a large gathering of people, but it was really a crush of media as they walked out. Anthony's great aunt, she's a little bit older. Uh, she had a cane, so deputies really surrounded them. It was like a fence of deputies um, as the media tried to ask some questions. They really didn't comment at all, but it took, I mean, it took some time to get from these front doors right here to the back, and then they went to their car and really didn't have uh, much to say. But that's really a play-by-play -play of what we had experienced uh, from inside of the courtroom from when the verdict uh, came down and, and until now. And I just finished talking with David Hancock, who, you know, answered. I said, what is next for Kyle Rittenhouse now? He said college is going to be next for him. Rittenhouse is a nursing student at Arizona State University. I believe they have an online uh, nursing program. So he's doing some sort of online classes to become a nurse. Uh, so that's what we know is next for him. Uh, he ha was has not been able to talk to Kyle since uh, the verdict came down, so we're not really sure what he is exactly saying or speaking uh, right now, but maybe we'll get more when Mark Richards, his attorney, uh, speaks a little bit. Ben and Stephanie? We're actually just getting word that Mark Richards is about to start his press conference. So as soon as we get that, we'll be bringing that to our viewers live. But I want to talk for a moment, Aaron. You did have a chance to speak with David Hancock. And Ben, and maybe this stuck out to you too, the most... Uh, you know, the most important words I think that he spoke in reaction to today's verdict, in the family's reaction, the Rittenhouse family's reaction to today's verdict, was saying, and I, I'm quoting here, inflection point in our country, and this really is bridging the divide. This is the moment the country can use to have conversations. So he is understanding that this case, as they said, he's, he's not spiking the football. There's no win here for anyone. There were two lives that were lost. Obviously, the initial incident that sparked this entire thing. But, uh, you know, his words, though, they, they, they struck a chord, I feel like, with everyone who was listening, Aaron. Did you take that away, too? I did, too, Stephanie, and that was, you know, the end of a thought, and then another reporter quickly jumped in, so I wish he was able to kind of flush that out a little bit more. Uh, but, no, I definitely did take that away. Uh, you know, he said that this is a moment as well for unity, uh, which, you know, we're, we're still working to see what that looks like uh, here in Kenosha. But, yeah, I did take away uh, uh, that moment as well. Guys, I want to jump in here because the president of the United States is speaking on this. Quote, he says, I stand by what the jury has to say. The jury system works. That's from President Biden. We do have a statement now from our governor, Tony Evers. His statement, uh, I think it's going to be a little small for us to read here. Steph? I can get up close here. Governor Tony Evers saying that, and I'm quoting here, no verdict will be able to bring back the lives of Anthony Huber and Joseph Rosenbaum or heal Gage Grosskreutz injuries, just as no verdict can heal the wounds or trauma experienced by Jacob Blake and his family. No ruling today changes our reality in Wisconsin that we have to work toward equity, accountability, and justice that communities across our state are demanding and deserve. We have this entire statement posted to our website where you can read it. We also have it uh, on our Twitter page, and you can see Governor Tony Evers tweeting that out as well. But uh, you know, this, this case, Ben, has gotten nationwide attention. It has from the very beginning when everything happened back on August 25th. Uh, so it's no surprise that we're hearing from the president as well from the, the governor. I want to bring in retired Supreme Court Justice, State Supreme Court Justice Janine Geske joining us live. We appreciate you, Justice, for coming back. Your uh, immediate thoughts here on this verdict. Well, I think it's obvious the jury worked very hard to come to their conclusions. And that's really what we expect of jurors. It was the state had a big burden and the jury ultimately decided that uh, the state did not meet its burden on any of the charges. I am I am concerned, too, that this be a point of unity and not a signal for protesters and counter protesters to bring weapons 
to those protests because it easily could result in more violence in our streets and we don't need any more deaths or injuries. So far at this point, we are not seeing that. So we want to make that very clear for our viewers because there has been so much worry, especially from a lot of the small business owners in and around Kenosha. You know, I have to ask you, was the length of time the jurors were deliberating for, did that bring you any sort of pause or did you just figure this is part of the process? It could take two hours, it could take 26 hours like it did in this case. Well, it told me they were divided. Um, they clearly were divided, and it took some time for some jurors to come to the conclusion that others had that the defendant was not guilty. Um, but, you know, from what we could tell on the outside, they went about it the way we want them to go about it, relying on the jury instructions, relooking at evidence, having deliberations, going home when they're tired and coming back the next day. Um, but clearly, this was not a unanimous jury when they started, and... Uh, I think they obviously took their oaths very seriously, as most jurors do. Kyle Rittenhouse cannot be charged criminally again. Do you think we'll see him in a courtroom again? I think it is not. I think it's not likely out of anything of this incident. Um, you know, it's possible that some of the victims or victims' families will want to sue him civilly. Um, but I think we certainly won't see him in another criminal case out of this incident. It's over. I'll ask you the same question that I asked defense attorney Jonathan Smith, and that was how much video evidence now plays a role in so many court cases because so many people, whether they have surveillance video on their homes, they have cell phones, drones up in the sky, as we saw in this case as well. How important do you see video playing a role or even changing the way trials take place in this kind of 21st technological century? Oh, I think it's immense. Even if you look at the Arbery case where there was video shot there, I think we're going to see more and more video. And, and jurors expect that. They see that on TV. They know things are being filmed. Um, and then officers who walk around with body cams. And so, you know, that I think that's it's a healthy thing that people can actually see what happened versus have people try to remember and describe it. But um, a lot of video, a lot of technology, um, and just so it doesn't get so complicated that the jury loses its path in trying to just simply figure out whether a party has met its burden. Janine Geske, retired state Supreme Court Justice, appreciate your time. We got to get straight out. We're hearing from Kyle Rittenhouse's lawyers. Let's listen. What he feels. Mark Alonso's life. Where does he go from here? Hey. <sighs> he has to get on with his life the best he can. I think eventually some anonymity will come back to it. Um, I don't think he'll continue to live in this area. Um, I think it's too dangerous. He's had 24-hour security since this happened. We're thankful that the judge protected his address. Um, everybody in this case, and when I say that, I mean prosecution, defense, to me, it's scary how many death threats we've had. You know, I was answering my phone on the way back from court in Kenosha. I don't, my office isn't that far. After the third death threat, I quit answering the phone. And Mark, what do you say to people who may look at this order? Do you still think that he has no business being in Kenosha? What do you think to people who are much better than I do? He had as much business being there as any of the demonstrators or the rioters. Um, that's all I can say. I mean, there's going to be people who will never agree with that statement. But, you know, if we all would just mind our own business a little bit, I think we'd all be better off. And it's a hard lesson to learn, but... Could, couldn't that have been said about Kyle? It, it, it could be. He was asked to be there. He wanted to help the community. And, you know, that's the narrative that the state went with. He shouldn't have been there. Um, he was asked to be there by Nick and Dominic. Um, and the Kandiri brothers wanted security. And, you know, I'm not trying to br blame anyone. I wish he had never been separated from Ryan Balch, and we would, wouldn't be here. Does he regret coming here to Kenosha? I, I don't believe he does. I, believe, I mean, you know, if he had to do it all over again and you said the same thing is going to happen and you're gonna, life is going to be put in a living hell for a year and you're going to not know if you're going to be a free man, he would say, I wouldn't go. Um, but we can't undo time. Mark, the, president, the president was just asked about the verdict. He says, I stand by what the jury has to say. The jury system works. Your response? I, 
<laughs> and I'm not laughing at President Biden. What I'm laughing at is a friend of mine who's a lawyer said, he goes, and him and I had done a big case together seven, eight years ago. And he said, do you think this Rittenhouse is going to be bigger than that case? And I said, you know, I do. And he said, why do you say that? And I said, I've never had a case, and I don't think I ever will, where within two days or three days of one another, you know, the president and the presidential candidate comment on it. And both of them had such different beliefs. Um, President Biden said some things that I think are so incorrect and untrue. He's not a white supremacist. I'm glad that he at least respects the jury verdict. And if the government had any information regarding his cell phone or anything that he'd been to any of those websites or been online doing that kind of stuff, it would have been introduced in evidence. It wasn't. We were the individuals who released his cell phone, which couldn't be cracked by the FBI because we had nothing to hide. No, I'm not. I'm not doing reruns. What's that? I, I'm a criminal defense attorney. I don't do civil stuff. Every case is different, and every case has surprises. Um, you know, hey, I learned I could wait 24 hours for a verdict. What about, uh, what happened to the $2 million bond? I expect there will be a fight over that. Um, you know, John Pierce is the person who posted the bond. Um, all of that money was raised on behalf of Kyle. Um, Lynn Wood and Fight Back say that they're entitled to it. Um, there was... And when I, I'm using round numbers, but there was half a million dollars, I think, that came directly from Wendy Rittenhouse from money she had raised. So there's going to be a fight over that, and I'm just thankful that there will be a fight over that because if he had lost, it wouldn't have mattered. You know, Kyle had aspirations to be a first responder. Is that still... He wants to be a nurse. Still wants to be a nurse. What would you say your biggest takeaway is from this 25-plus-hour jury deliberation? What do you think that that says? I need to be more patient. Now that he has been acquitted, can you look back and point to a pivotal moment that was successful for you that you think created this outcome? Getting rid of the first two lawyers. And, you know, that might be a smart alecky comment, but I mean that. And I got my best friend, Corey, to join, who I trust. Um, And to be able to work with somebody who you don't have to check their work, you don't worry about what they're going to be doing, you give them a project and it's done as good or better as you'd do yourself, it's priceless. There's been a lot of commentary on the prosecutor's performance in this case. What would you say being up there with them every day? You know, you must have got here a little bit late. Um, I've known Tom Binger for a long time. I knew him when he was a civil lawyer. I'm disappointed with some of the things he did, um, and I've said why. Such as what? Putting on the Kandiri brothers when you know they're lying. Um, changing your prosecution, going with provocation after you say that my client chased him down and shot him in the back. Um, calling him an active shooter when he's not. You know, justice is done when the truth is reached, and I don't know that it's set up to do that. But a prosecutor is supposed to seek the truth. It's not about winning. And this case became about winning. And that's probably why it got so personal. How about the judge? What do you say about how the judge handled the case? You know, I've I've never seen so much made of so little. And that's not to pick on you guys or anything like that, but I've tried cases as a prosecutor 100 years ago in front of Judge Schrader. I've tried cases as a defense lawyer, and him and I butted heads as a defense lawyer. Um, Judge Schrader gives you a fair trial as a defendant. You don't want him to sentence your client, okay? Um, But in this case, we were looking for a fair trial, and if we lost, we knew what was going to happen. So it wouldn't have mattered whether it was that judge or some other judge. He's getting life in prison. So I'd rather have a fair trial. 
I thought he gave us a fair trial. Um, you know, this, everybody got all crazy about the tumbler. Who cares? That has nothing to do with this. I, I mean, I've seen the tumbler used before. I've seen clerks pull things out and suspicious things happen. Um, Kyle pulled it out. And I'll be real honest, we had every juror scored on a, a, a sheet, and we were devastated when those th three of the six jurors were separated from the panel because we thought they were three of our st strongest jurors. And Kyle pulled their names. So I think it's a good system. Um, I, you know, I've got a trial in front of them, you know, a big case. And maybe in that one, I'll think he's unfair, but he's a fair judge. But he also said something about, like, in the future, he plans on rethinking the possibility of live coverage I, to this extent. Uh, Given what you guys have gone through, you know, he mentioned that you guys went through a lot, you, there were threats made to you. What do you think that that should be going forward, setting a precedent about? I don't know about that. You know, I, I think... I think that I've never done a case that was televised gavel to gavel. I've had cases that have gotten media coverage. I was kind of, um, I knew this case was big. I had no idea it was going to be this big. I mean, I've gotten calls from people I haven't seen in 25 years. It, it's just bizarre. Um, and I, I'll never be able to figure out exactly what it is that caused the interest that it did. Um, I don't think it made the attorneys act different. I don't think it made the judge act different. Um, I suspect when everything cools down, if there was another big case in front of Judge Schrader, he'd let the cameras in. Mark, will Kyle say anything to the crowd that's gathering down there now on his behalf? I, you about, know, about, I mean, I don't, we don't know that there'll be trouble, but you know, there's people gathering by the time we left. There were more and more people showing up. Do you think he, anything he might say could uh, make things go better than before? I, I, th I don't. Um, the people who are going to end up causing trouble, they don't want to hear from Kyle Rittenhouse. I, it, and it's, you know, what, remain calm? I, you know. What do you think the wider implications of this verdict are? I don't, you know, I don't think it's, the, I don't think it's that kind of case. I mean, you know, when, when you want to talk about implications and precedent and things like that, is it ever going to happen again? You know, is there ever going to be just a total unrest in Kenosha or some other city, and that's going to happen? You know, I just don't see that. Um, it was a case about self-defense, the right to protect oneself from, you know, Mr. Rosenbaum. Don't want to speak ill of the dead, but he wasn't a nice person, and everybody knows why. And a lot of that didn't come in in front of the jury. So... I don't know that there's any broader implications. I don't want to make it bigger than it is. A couple of politicians in Wisconsin have used the word vigilante to refer to your client since the verdict came down. How do you react to that? Maybe they should have watched the trial. <laughs> I know Kyle Rittenhouse said thank you to you. You said that after the verdict was read. Do you share any more about general reaction from him or his family in that moment? You know, it's one of those things that anything that's said at this time it's kind of meaningless. We have to take it in, reflect on it, and, um, you know, what's he thanking me for? And I don't mean to, that it's insincere, but it takes a while to process what happened today. I haven't processed it. I, I don't think, that I, I can't answer that question. If I had to guess, and it would be a guess, I don't think they'll stay in Wisconsin. I got a trial in a week. I'm going to take a couple of days off and go to the Badger game tomorrow, which I've jump missed. Up, jump around. Hopefully, I've missed a couple of Badger games because of this trial, and I'm very much. We were afraid we weren't going to get to go because they were going to have them deliberate on Saturday, and I want to see them beat Nebraska. Do you have any sense that they agreed to those verdicts much earlier, but maybe just took some extra time to at least leave the impression they? I, I don't believe that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's. I don't believe that. I, I mean, there was the questions, and I think I, I said this to some people yesterday when they asked to call off at four o'clock. 
you could see the tenseness in those people, the jurors, at least I could or I sensed it, who were entering that room. And, you know, if they wanted to quit early because I think they were tense. And I, if there was some early verdict and they were playing all of us for fools, um, they're great actors and actresses. I don't think that was the case. I believe so. I, you know, I have, I have clients from 30 years ago. I still talk to. I, I get my oldest, one of my oldest favorite clients. He moved out of Racine, moved to Minneapolis. Um, he texted me congratulations. I talk to him once a month. I try to stay in touch with clients who want to stay in touch with me. Um, I like to see him do well, and I hope that Kyle does. Do you think that they'll keep a low profile? I hope so. What do you think the amount of time that the jury took to do this says about how they handled it? They took it very seriously. I, it, as I said, it's the longest jury I've ever had out. Um, wow. Can I go home? Go home. Anything else we haven't asked you? Mark, do you think he'll ever talk? The longest jury I've ever had Probably. out. I wow. Know. Those are the comments from Mark Richards. He talked about a lot there. Talked about the threats he's received. It's scary how many death threats I've had. Said he had to shut off his phone at one point and said that this case became more politically driven than he expected. It became a bigger case than he thought, and he thought the judge was fair. And the jury, obviously, in his case, made the right decision. Yeah, Mark Richards says that, you know, this was the first case that uh, the media covered gavel to gavel for him. So, you know, he said it was a case of self-defense. Obviously, that's exactly what it came down to. He also mentioned he was disappointed in the prosecution because he says it wasn't so much about seeking the truth. It became about winning. We want to go live now to our Bill Miston, who is outside. As that crowd has gathered, are more people showing up, Bill, because you've been there. You've seen this all day. Well, Stephen, Ben, what I could tell you is that there's been more media assembled here than demonstrators than what we've seen over the last several days, at least uh, this afternoon when that verdict uh, was announced. But what I'm going to step out of the shot here so a photojournalist Tim Primo can kind of push in within the last uh, several minutes, a, a handful of people uh, with a snare drum and a banner uh, who... Uh, aren't in uh, agreement uh, with the jury um, marching up to the courthouse steps. Uh, people have uh, kind of remained on the courthouse steps. I'd say probably a dozen or so demonstrators uh, surrounded by some onlookers as well as the media uh, continuing to talk uh, and uh, debate. Uh, I think if I could put that lightly um, after the verdict was read. And uh, so this is kind of some of the most, I, I, I guess, activity uh, we've seen as these uh, marchers marched up uh, about a handful or six uh, people with a banner uh, that uh, don't agree uh, that the uh, verdict uh, was just and, and right. Uh, but that's what the jury uh, brought down. And in and, and speaking with people over the last several days, uh, and I, I know this was in my report uh, last night, is that uh, I spoke to a woman who uh, traveled here from uh, Washington State, and you know she says that the verdict or just the uh, events here in Kenosha and what's been going on, whether that is uh, from what started all of this, the shooting of Jacob Blake by a Kenosha police officer, to the, uh, the protests and unrest here uh, following a, a summer where we saw protests and marches for uh, social and racial justice. And the verdict in this case, uh, she said it was a microcosm of what we're seeing across the country and uh, that there is a divide. And that uh, people are still trying to suss out the details here and, and, and uh, kind of come to maybe some sort of consensus. You've heard the spokesperson for uh, Kyle Rittenhouse uh, talk about it. You heard Mark Richards. You've heard uh, Jacob Blake's uncle, Justin Blake, as well as uh, those who were here uh, throughout the trial uh, who were uh, supporting the families of Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, and Gage Grosskreutz, uh, that there needs to be some sort of unity and, and a way to move forward from this. And, and the woman that I was speaking to, I, I did follow up with her today as well, because uh, she was still here. And uh, you know, she's been talking with a lot of people, and, and she may not be of uh, the 
the type of, of, of person that may align with, uh, you know, people who are searching for social justice, but she understands where those people are coming from and that there needs to be some sort of uh, bridging of that divide. And are we seeing that here today? Possibly. Uh, but uh, what we can tell you is that, you know, this is still a very polarizing uh, and, and divided uh, uh, sentiment. And I think we're going to see how this uh, moves forward here in the next couple hours and, and days. All right, Bill Miston reporting live outside the Kenosha County Courthouse, where not that many people have gathered at this point. He said maybe a dozen people. There's actually more members of the media than actual protesters there, which is uh, probably a good thing since many people were on the edge of their seats with all of this and the verdict coming down today. 202, let's hear the verdict as it came down. H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Members of the jury, are these your unanimous verdicts? Is there anyone who does not agree with the verdicts as read? No. Uh, would you wish the jury pulled? No. Okay. Uh, okay, folks, your uh, job is done, and uh, we started just about three weeks ago. And I, uh, I told you it could last two weeks and two days. This is two weeks. This is three weeks. Uh, you were a wonderful jury to work with. Religious I'm leaders sure. are weighing in. Mary Stoker Smith's in uh, the newsroom with the latest. Mary. Well, Ben, good afternoon. Archbishop Listecki inviting people to promote peace after this verdict read today. I'm going to read you the statement that he put out. He says, and we quote, during times like this with severe division among people and the potential for social unrest, it is important for us to remember Jesus's commandment to love one another. As Americans, we rely upon the rule of law and our justice system, which ensures the rights of all of our citizens. We need to remember that every individual is made in the image and the likeness of God, and therefore, we need to follow the two great commandments, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. By doing this, we recognize the human dignity in every person and treat each other with respect and love. Again, those uh, words from Archbishop Jerome Listecki coming in this afternoon. He is one of many uh, public officials, public people weighing in on today's verdict in our community. We are going to hear from much more, of course, as the evening rolls on. Uh, we have a lot to get to and a lot of un to unfold. But for now, we'll keep sifting through these and bring them to you as they become available to us. But for now, I'll send it back to the studio with Ben and Steph. Mary. Appreciate it. This is just coming in from Jason Calvi. It says the National Guard still on standby. They're in Milwaukee County and Waukesha County. 500 members not needed right now. And we have seen those scenes down at the courthouse. Uh, Steph, you said it. There's dozens of people, not hundreds or thousands. Mm -hmm. So, but they're still on standby, according to Jason Calvi, who's been watching that angle for us. Well, it is 2:05 on this Friday afternoon. It took four days for the 12 jurors to finally come to a verdict, and Kyle Rittenhouse, as you just heard moments ago, uh, deemed not guilty on all the counts that he was facing. Five total counts when everything was said and done. He did face more charges to begin with, Ben, but he was facing a mandatory life sentence if he was convicted on the most serious charge in this case. So. The case was about self-defense, and in the end, self-defense is what won. Let's bring in a legal expert. Ion Maine, assistant professor of law at UW-Madison. Appreciate your time. Professor, your reaction to this verdict? Yeah, Ben, I wasn't, wasn't surprised. Um, I, I am troubled by the verdict in the sense of what it means for self-defense. Um, I think that the jury probably considered the fact that this is a 17-year-old boy who was engaged in this activity, and I think that probably impacted the, the and, and rightfully so, impacted the, the result. But in terms of what it means more broadly for self-defense in the United States, I find it troubling. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, the, the issue is how much discretion does someone have 
um, when they carry a firearm to use deadly force against someone who is unarmed. And we heard pre-trial when the prosecutor asked the expert, if Mr. Rittenhouse had not been armed and was aggressed upon in the same way by Mr. Rosenbaum, could he have used deadly force against Mr. Rosenbaum? And the answer was no, which raises the question. If you have a firearm, do you have more discretion to use deadly force against others? And that was really an undercurrent in this trial and then re surfaces that issue for the nation to discuss if that's the world we want to live in. Well, the nation is certainly discussing this. I mean, we heard from former President Trump and President Joe Biden just days after all of this happened last summer. We obviously just heard from Joe Biden just a short time ago, basically saying that the jury has spoken at this point. What is your take on political figures, very big political figures, the biggest in the world, commenting on cases like this and potentially prematurely? Right. I mean, it's good as to the last point. As to the first point, it just reflects that we watch this as a nation because there were TV cameras in the courtroom. I thought that was an extraordinary moment. We've had a couple of moments like that in our history. And it allows everyone in the nation to be watching on how the criminal justice system works to a certain degree um, and to then make your own decision as to whether or not this is a fair process. And I think that's really important. And also important is the issue. We are determining, in, this, in a sense, on how we value life in the United States and what it means when we encounter each other. And this is really close to what our identity as people are. And so I understand leaders um, weighing in on this because it is a moment of cultural significance uh, in the United States. But do you feel that a lot of people didn't necessarily watch the entire case gavel to gavel? They just heard snippets on whatever news channel they favor that maybe they weren't getting the entire picture here and then jumping to judgment, as many people do. I mean, we're all human. I think we all can admit at some point we've jumped to judgment prematurely. But in something like this that can have so many ramifications and can lead to potential violence and riots and all the things that many in the Kenosha community fear and still fear as of this evening, uh, you know, where are we as a nation when it comes to that? You know, it's a really great set of observations and questions. I don't know if I can answer any better than anyone else. Um, I do think that as a lawyer, someone who's litigated really complex, high stakes cases in the criminal system, um, there is a sense that one gets of alienation because uh, no one really knows um, outside of the stakeholders in the actual trial what all the facts are. And as you say, people get snippets and things like that. But at the same time, the opportunity to watch this is there. But to your point, yeah, there's we only have limited time to absorb this, and we are going to bring our own, obviously, lived experience and ideology into this debate. But I still think that the transparency that was permitted here by the media being there and the discussions that have occurred, there is a healthy aspect to it. I understand certainly from emails I've received, there can be some pretty mean and harsh and, and fairly uh, not really dialogue interested kind of contributions to the debate. But there has been a lot of vigorous debate. I can see it in my classrooms about what's going on and what this means. And I think that's probably a good thing. Taking a live picture on the left there, that's demonstrators on the steps. They've been there since this verdict was read. Uh, they're chanting, hanging out right now, and Ion Main continues to join us here. Let's talk about the decision. You say your students have debated this. The jury, 12 of them, all were able at the end of the day to see this the same way. This is something that always surprises people because uh, there, in my mind, it's unquestionable that there were divisions ideologically uh, within the jury that reflects some of the divisions within the community. I mean, that's just what happens when you have a jury of your peers. It reflects generally the community's values, generally, depending on the community reflected in the jury. But I imagine there was some division. Um, and so the question is a great one. Why was this not just automatically a hung jury? But I actually think juries are really encouraged to find accountability or uh, determine that the person in their mind did not, their actions did not rise to a level of, of criminal liability. Again, there could be civil liability in this case, but as to criminal liability, 
Um, there's a lot of pressure on the jury and they've heard a lot of the facts and they've felt the tension in the room. So I think the responsibility that they feel is much more acute than us watching from the outside. And the idea of coming together in consensus um, is a little more natural for a jury just because of the unnatural circumstances that they're under such intense pressure to come to some consensus. You brought it up, so I'm going to ask the question. Do you think that we could see a civil trial uh, involving Kyle Rittenhouse in the future? Well, absolutely. It's a different standard of proof. Um, it's a different set of um, dynamics that lead up to an outcome in a civil case. There's depositions. There's much more searching inquiries into the facts than you actually get on the criminal side. And so facts that you may not have discovered on the criminal side are often discovered in civil litigation that may be good or bad for either party, but they change the dynamics of the litigation and the outcome. Um, and in addition, there may be more ready that because of the civil litigation is different and the repercussions are different in a civil trial, there may be a settlement that you don't get in a place where it's kind of an all or nothing uh, situation on the criminal side. I'm not an attorney and I'm not a professor of law. Can you talk about the standard of proof, how it might be different if, if this does go to a civil trial compared to what we just saw in this criminal case? Yeah, and um, by the way, just to, to be really professorial about it, a lot of social scientists say that the standard of proof doesn't matter, it's just who has the most plausible story. But I would also think that anyone who's a criminal defendant would want the highest standard of proof, right? Um, and so on the criminal side, the prosecution has a burden which is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is supposedly the toughest, I don't think it is. Um, there's one that's clear and convincing, which I think is a tougher standard, but we go with beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, on the civil side, it's like a 51%. Um, which one's more likely? What's the more likely story? Uh, it's called preponderance of the evidence. Um, and so it's a lower standard that a plaintiff, say, the, uh, you know, of, if there's a wrongful death claim by the family uh, of, say, Mr. Huber, um, Mr. Rosenbaum, the standard that they would have to show of wrongful death is a preponderance of evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt like the prosecution. You know, listening to you talk right now, it, it, it just is a nice reminder that all of us sitting here watching all of this from home, if maybe our viewers at home have been those who have just been glued to our YouTube channel watching this case day in and day out, we're not attorneys. We, we aren't in the weeds. We don't know all the language and the lingo and the statutes and all that sort of stuff. So when it comes to jumping to judgment, you know, we all have to be really careful when it comes, especially with a case like this, where there is so much evidence and video evidence that is proof if you can see it clearly enough. Exactly right. And when I talk to my law students, I am talking to them about the fact that they are learning a language and that language tends to exclude others, right? And um, there's an aspect that it's important to have a certain discipline in language to ensure that there's shared understandings about what that language means. But at the same time, the risks are what we're seeing and that creates misunderstanding between what the legal system is doing um, and for the people watching kind of outside the law, uh, what's going on and trying to understand what the outcome is. We're joined right now for, for with Ion Maine from UW Law School. Kyle Rittenhouse found not guilty on all five counts. Ion, I want to ask you, Mark Richards, we heard from him. That's Kyle Rittenhouse's defense attorney. He took a couple of shots at the prosecution. He says justice is done when the truth is revealed. And he said this case became about winning for the prosecution. Do you agree with that? Well, uh, once you're in litigation, that's kind of obvious. Um, both parties are heavily invested in the case. And um, it's true uh, that the prosecution uh, made early decisions in this case to prosecute Mr. Rittenhouse. Um, but anyone looking at the film could come to reasonably two different conclusions. So I don't find it unreasonable uh, for the prosecutor to have brought this case. Again, I've been pretty clear that I don't think they should have prosecuted Mr. Rittenhouse as an adult. He's a 17 year old kid. I understand that's the law in Wisconsin, but I just don't agree with it. I think he was a juvenile and should have been processed in the juvenile system. But that's what it is, and that's what the law provides. And there was a basis, um, certainly, that this was a uh, criminal act. And so I don't think that 
it's it's an I, I think it's an unfair statement in this case, especially where you see a nation that's absolutely divided about it. That people on both sides have very very different views, um, and one could argue they're both reasonable. And so I don't see what Mr. Richards is uh, saying there. I don't really agree that the prosecution just brought this to win. I think they were invested in it because the video for many people was really shocking. Do you believe the prosecution brought forth the correct charges in this case? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, in certain respects, I understand that the first charge against Mr. Rosenbaum was reckless because in the end of the day, the video doesn't show a, a clear view of what happened. Uh, and, and then on the same token, as to Mr. Huber, you could see the entire incident on video, and there you had, an, you know, an intentional homicide charge. And to me, that makes sense. Those kind of assessments by the prosecution, one, you know, both in both situations, someone died, but there was a different level of charging based on the evidence available to the prosecution. So I, I saw a basis for the charging in this case. Ion Main from UW Law, we really appreciate your time getting that instant reaction to this verdict that just came in this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Mary Stoker Smith in the newsroom. She's got some new statements for us. Mary, what do you got? Yeah, I got a couple for you. Uh, one from the Kenosha County District Attorney. He says, in part, Kenosha County uh, Attorney Michael Gravely today issuing the following statement We respect the jury verdict based on three and a half days of careful deliberations. Certainly, issues regarding the privilege of self defense remain highly contentious in our current times. We ask that all members of the public accept the verdicts peacefully and not resort to violence. In addition, we are hearing from Scott Walker, who has said the following. All of us who knew that actually happened in Kenosha last year assumed this would be the verdict. Thankfully, the jury thought the same. Pray that the kind of violence seen then does not happen again. And pray for the jurors that they too might be safe from the violence. Again, we continue to hear from state elected officials, former and current, also from uh, members of the public. We are continuing to sift through these, and we will bring them to you just as soon as we can get them on the screen for you. But again, a lot of reaction coming in on this very emotional day in Kenosha. For now, I'll send it back to the studio. Yeah, that reaction coming in minute by minute, Mary. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. We want to get out right now to our Angelica Sanchez. Angie has been on the ground. She has been following this trial since the very beginning. You've been following this case, Angie, really for more than a year since everything first happened back on August 25th of 2020. That's right, Stephanie. And as I was looking back at my notes just a moment ago, uh, a quote that struck out to me was the judge multiple times throughout this trial talking about the importance of maintaining public confidence in the outcome of this trial. Uh, as you might recall, this is one of the reasons why a juror was dismissed early on in the process for an inappropriate joke about the Jacob Blake shooting. Uh, so that's just one quote that stuck out to me. And then when I look back at opening arguments, the way that this started, you know, the prosecution had a lengthy uh, argument uh, calling Rittenhouse a, an active shooter, an instigator uh, on the scene, while the defense, you know, they stuck through uh, their arguments that it was a life or death situation for the then 17-year-old in their opening arguments. They showed video, photos. They quickly tailored uh, the narrative of what they claim happened that night, and clearly the jury, uh, as we now know today, agrees uh, with the self-defense claim Claims that uh, the defense made uh, along this trial, uh, but again, with the with the judge in this case, you know, multiple times he reiterated the importance of maintaining public confidence. And you know, when we talk about the jury, the jury exited the courthouse now about an hour ago. Uh, I can tell you, the jurors they had their faces covered. Uh, they understand the gravity of the decision that they've made. You know, they took time in deliberations, and when they exited the courthouse, they did not want to speak to any reporters. They were heavily uh, guarded. You can imagine that they are probably, uh, you know, having a sigh of relief to no longer be on this jury, but uh, they took that assignment very seriously. Uh, you know, two days ago, uh, we, when we first realized just how much deliberations uh, were going on, they were going straight into the courthouse, walking into that deliberation room. There was no uh, greeting from the judge. There was no, let's get things started. Welcome to the jury. No, it was straight to work in this case. 
So, you know, again, reflecting on uh, just this trial overall, that is a quote that sticks out to me is the judge saying that it was important to maintain public confidence in this trial. And I think that the jury really listened to that, which is why potentially that's why they took so long in deliberations. They were doing their due diligence. Angelica Sanchez, we appreciate all your great reporting this entire case. Thank you. Let's get out to Bill Miston. Bill, there are still parts of this city that are boarded up. We just got a statement in from Uptown Kenosha saying we believe that the high profile case verdict of Kyle Rittenhouse does not change the city of Kenosha from moving forward with its diligent work efforts for equity, unity and equality in the Uptown Kenosha community. That is the area that was so badly burned during the riots. This community's forever changed what happened last summer in 2020. You know, Ben, uh, to what Angelica was saying about uh, this case and, and wanting to uh, keep public confidence in it, you could also say that there is a lot of public opinion about it and how this all started with, obviously, the, the shooting of Jacob Blake. And, and throughout the trial, uh, we saw... Uh, uh, questions from people who were outside of the courthouse as things were going on inside and that continues this evening and and what we uh, see here now as you can see is just uh, uh, some things are breaking up here uh, uh, I know uh, there was a, a group of people that kind of marched through those people have have since left uh, still some points of contention here uh, there was a, a man who uh, had been seen uh, uh, kind of throughout the last several days kind of being in the middle of, of of arguments and in, in, in some way instigating some things and, and at one point uh, uh, saying some pretty uh, offensive things to a woman who was uh, wearing a headscarf who was Muslim uh, and that kind of stirring some things up out here and and that having since uh, kind of uh, 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 resolved itself and and but there is a lot of uh, sense of resolve though uh, for those that live in this community to move on and try and and continue on with this I mean there are people that are here from all across the country if not the world uh, media members as well as people who are here uh, as trial tourists in some way uh, wanting to see what was going on and those people will leave but there will be people like uh, us who here who have been reporting on this and, and report on this for the community, those that live in this community will still be here and, and telling the stories that uh, will continue on of, of what will move forward uh, for this community and how they will move forward. And obviously there's a lot of scars, both physical as well as emotional uh, scars left from uh, those nights here in Kenosha, as well as uh, what has transpired since these shootings and throughout this entire trial. And there is a lot of public opinion about what occurred in the the courtroom today and opinions about whether or not the jury made the decision that maybe people wanted uh, them to make. But that, at the end of the day, is the system. And as you saw, whether it was statements from President Biden, Governor Tony Evers, former Governor Scott Walker, those in the community, uh, there there is a sense that this is the decision that was made. And those jurors had a very, very heavy hand uh, or heavy heart, no doubt, in trying to figure out what was the right answer, and, and this is what they came up with. Our Bill Miston reporting live for us. We're happy to see that uh, it looks like all things are peaceful and quiet outside the courthouse with more media members than protesters out there this afternoon. Bill said that he'll be staying here in the days ahead, will be staying here in the days ahead. One person who will not be staying here in the days ahead, Kyle Rittenhouse, his attorney, saying he's going to leave the state. He doesn't feel safe here. He's had death threats, and he will be moving outside of Wisconsin. We don't know when that will happen, but don't expect to see him in the grocery store. I want to go out to Aaron Maven. He was live in the courthouse when this happened, in the courtroom when that verdict came down. Aaron, you described hearing gasps. Yeah, you know, just before the verdict was read, the judge basically told everyone inside the courtroom that he didn't want any reaction. But, you know, that's something hard. It's hard to hold back emotions, especially for family members. So there were uh, gasps, especially from Wendy Rittenhouse, and uh, who is Kyle Rittenhouse's mother, and his sisters, too. Uh, when the verdict was being read, we saw that Kyle was crying and shaking and fell down to his knees and had, actually had to be lifted up by an attorney. And I was looking back at Wendy Rittenhouse, his mother. She was holding holding on tight to David Hancock, who's a spokesperson 
for the Rittenhouse family. She was holding on tight to him, and she also gasped and made some sort of uh, loud noise uh, when the verdict was read. On the other side, there was the great aunt of Ant uh, Anthony Huber and also his girlfriend and the girlfriend of Joseph Rosenbaum. They were quiet throughout uh, the verdict being read. And then as they walked outside of the courthouse, uh, there were tears in the eyes of Hannah Giddings, who's uh, Anthony Huber's girlfriend. They really didn't comment much. She had tears in her eyes as they were just surrounded by deputies, offensive deputies, walked from outside of the courthouse uh, to their cars. We know what's going to happen next with Kyle Rittenhouse. His family spokesperson said he's headed to college. We don't know what's next for the family members of Anthony Huber, Joseph Rosenbaum, as they still process a verdict that we all learned a little bit ago. Ben and Stephanie. So many emotions running high in this case. You see on the left-hand side of your screen there, Kyle Rittenhouse's reaction when all five charges against him, he received those not guilty verdicts. So, you know, emotions on both sides of this case, you know, it's been ongoing for more than a year now. There's been so much media attention, so much national coverage, even international coverage. And it's good to see, at least at this moment, at almost 2.30 on this Friday afternoon, that things have remained peaceful in Kenosha. And uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, he's going home tonight, a free man, and he's not going to prison for life. We do know the National Guard remains on standby. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like they're needed right now. As we said, there's only people in the dozens down there and they are acting very calm but they're still in areas like Milwaukee and Waukesha counties to be called up if needed but police really haven't had to do anything out there today so stay with us we're going to go back to our regular programming right now but our coverage continues online on fox6now.com and on your fox6 news app we'll see you at four